Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where executive function, self-efficacy, learning to how to learn are the issues we tackle. And I'm your host, Sucheta Kamath. My hope is through these conversations, you will get to know more about self-management skills. And today is a special day because my guest is a man who has started, built, and sold three companies, written five bestseller books. He's a CNN contributor and a host of number one podcast on ADHD, Faster Than Normal. Uh, you can, you will be able to tell as you hear his speech, he does speak fast. And all that in spite of his ADHD or more like because of it. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Shankman. Welcome, Peter, to the podcast. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's start with this. Um, I, I ask uh, my guests, uh, particularly those who are researchers and scientists who uh, about their own childhood, but because you are, we are going to do, do it a little bit in a flipped way, I will start asking you about your childhood and we will jump into ADHD slowly and surely. But tell me a little bit, were you a delightful child or a facetious one or rambunctious one or all of it? And how did your ADHD manifest in early years, particularly before you entered school? I suppose it depends on who you ask. I, uh, you know, wasn't, uh, I didn't play well with others. That was pretty much put on my report card a lot, as was uh, needs to settle down in class was, was a big one. It's, you know, for me, it was tough because um, not really knowing what ADHD was at the time, I just sort of survived any way I could, right? I didn't really know what was going on or, or what I was doing. I, I just, you know, I couldn't figure out why I was constantly, uh, you know, making jokes in class, all those things. And I realized it was, everything I was doing was tied to trying to create dopamine. I didn't know it at the time. ADHD didn't exist when I was a kid. What, sit, what existed was sit down, you just rep in the class, you know. So um, all I knew how to do was, was, was whatever I could, you know, and, and it wasn't easy and it was uh, actually quite hard. But um, I figured out that over time I could, I could use that to my advantage if I were able to play it right. And so it took a while. It took a long while, but over time I was able to get it. So what was the culture of your household? What kind of temperament did your parents possess? And did that aid or deter your ADHD coping? And I, I often ask people, they, huh? My Go parents ahead. are wonderful. They still are. You know, they were very, um, um, uh, they cared a lot about what I was going through and they were very kind to me and they, they let me, sort of experience, experiment and learn and, 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 and you know, do whatever I could. Um, it couldn't have been easy for them. No question about it. It could not have been easy for them. It was, uh, it was difficult. You know, it was, it was hard to be um, a different kid in, in New York City public schools. Um, but I survived. What made you so different? What were you doing that made it difficult for them? Well, you know, um, again, I didn't play well with others. I didn't fit into any of the cliques. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't do those things that, that, most kids did. You know, when you're a kid in New York City, in any public school, your job basically is to make friends and be popular. And I just wasn't really good at that. Uh, you know, it, I didn't, it took me a long time to realize that I, my social acuity wasn't on point. Um, and uh, over time, it got better. But it took a long, it took many, many years, probably took it to my, probably my early to mid 30s before I really came into my own. You know, it's so striking as, as you tell your stories uh, through your podcast and in your book and in the interviews that I've heard you speak, that there is a definite um, awareness that you bring to the listener. So much of social relationship was where your ADHD kind of was <laughs> uh, um, a sore point for you. And, and in the academic context, so many people are focused on child doing well, being organized, turning something in. And they're missing the point of that acceptability, relationship building and acceptance of that being different. And, and somehow that gets kind of sidelined a little bit. So were you, um, when did you personally become aware that you were different? And what did actually, can you give us some examples of what was it 
uh, about you showing up and not fitting in. What did that mean actually in the, in the classroom, on the playground, on a play date? What did that mean to you? I knew right away that I had, um, you know, that I was different. It, for me, it was, uh, you know, I had a really hard time making friends. Um, I was always trying to dominate the conversation. I was always trying to, uh, uh, you know, make a joke or try to be funny or trying to get people to notice me. I, you know, I didn't really fit in and it was difficult to, um, to sort of uh, figure out how to fix that. Um, so that made it tough. You know, it made it difficult for, um, it made it difficult for me to be normal, quote unquote, right? And I just remember I tried really hard, but over time, again, and this came way too late, probably in my early 30s, I realized that it didn't really matter what other people thought of me. I stopped caring uh, more or less what other people thought of me. What mattered is uh, um, what I thought of myself. Wow. You know, that's the only thing that really, really mattered after a while. Um, sort of what, what I was doing and, and, and was I making myself happy, right? And, and, and that to me was the most important, uh, most important thing. It's really hard though, you know, and that's what uh, I, I feel the compassion in my heart because that kind of insight takes a while to, and, and lots of running, uh, like bumping against the walls before that uh, kicks in. And sounds like you had in, incredible support of your parents, but that it alone was not adequate. So let's talk, talk a little bit about uh, transition to middle school and high school, where executive function is, uh, dysfunction rather, kind of starts emerging. So, and it's not limited to making relationships, but also making a relationship to your learning, uh, kind of producing and uh, you know, working on projects and uh, meeting deadlines and planning and organizing, systematizing yourself. What, how were your middle school and high school years? And why do you think they're such hard years for ADHD kids? They're difficult because we are being asked to do a lot in one specific way. You know, it, it, it's, I think it's the premise that we are being told to do something. Um, this is the way you have to do it. There's no wiggle room here. At least it was like that when I was in school. It's and you know that, like that. I didn't necessarily do things that way uh, well. You know, it was tough. Um, you know, for me, it was, uh, uh, you know, I liked, I did my homework. I remember I had a commute in high school. I had to take the Staten Island Ferry every day. And uh, I would usually do my homework on the ferry. There was something about the, uh, about the uh, hustle and bustle of the commute that actually soothed me and, and allowed me to focus and work. And everyone thought I was crazy. Oh my God, how can you do it? You're gonna get everything wrong. But it turns out I did really well when I was on that, on that, uh, on that, on that ferry. Um, but again, you know, school is by design, and I'm not saying this is the right or the wrong way of doing things, but by design, school is very much about, here's how you have to do it. And any other way you do it, even if you get the right answer is wrong. And so doing things uh, in a different way, you know, never seemed to work well for me because I'd always get called on it by teachers, by uh, administrators, by my parents, whatever. You know, I remember my parents, um, they were very much against my, my, my listening to music while I did my homework. But it turns out that, you know, countless studies now have shown that Listening to music can actually help tremendously. Uh, it, it encourages centers of the brain to react uh, when you're working. Um, but again, these are just things we didn't know. You know, these are things we didn't know as a kid, and I didn't know them. And and so here I am trying to trying to you know trying to do a little better now, I guess. And it's so funny you mentioned that we didn't know any better, Peter. You know, things have changed, but there's still old-fashioned conventional wisdom type of thinking that is so anti. ADHD brain that parents are still wanting them to turn the music off or be completely quiet and still and none of that works. So tell me a little bit about um, this em concept of embracing ADHD versus disowning the, your ADHD. And, and a lot of times I feel a lack of education or proper guidance regarding the nature and, and the scope of ADHD 
uh, if you don't uh, empower the child with that knowledge, that can be really hard for the kid to understand and become that full embracing adult. But you did this work on your own, sounds like, or came to that conclusion at least. So what were the things you were trying to disown and when did you lean into it and take, own it, own your ADHD? I'd say probably my late 30s um, when I realized, okay, here's what I have and here's what I got. Um, I don't have a choice. I can either benefit from this or I can let it consume and destroy me. Hmm. Which one do I want? Right. And so faced with that, you know, when you boil things down, makes life a little easier, I guess. Yeah. And so I sort of realized what was up and I realized that I could, you know, you control the things you can control, yeah. right? And I realized that that was something I could control. I could control my ADHD by putting rules into place that would allow me to do that. And that's what I've been doing. You know, it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't so much that I wanted to embrace my ADHD. That came later. Originally, it was just, hey, I've had some amazing success and some incredible failures. What can I learn from both of them? And one of the things I wound up learning is they all seem to come back to my doing certain things in certain ways. Positive when I did them one way, negative when I did them another. And that taught me, I guess, where I am now. And that, you know, when I finally realized that almost everything about that had to do with my ADHD, it made life a little easier to understand. Great, so what was happening at age 30 or around age 30 in your life? What were the successes that you had encountered by then? And what were the failures that taught you a lot? And how would you part that with our listener? Uh, what kind of, if you can give us examples of that, that'd be great. So I think that, you know, I remember very specifically being in college and uh, having a couple of friends. And then one day I made a joke or something and I doubled down on the joke and I tried to make another joke. And, and the first joke didn't land and normal people would say, wow, that was, that was a really, you know, you try to make a joke, it really, it failed miserably, don't make a second one. But I didn't get that. I did, made a second one because I, oh, I have to fix it, you know. And made it really tough. There's people who lived on my floor and it made it really tough and wound up not being their friends. And, um, you know, I just remember learning, you know, I call them cringe moments, right? These moments that are like, oh my God, that was the worst thing. How could I have done that? Oh my God. You know, it's the moments when you're about to go to sleep, you remember them, you're like, oh crap, now I'm gonna be up all night. But um, on the flip side, I've learned how my brain works in such a way, I've learned there are certain things I can do to improve my focus, my motivation, my whatever, my drive. Um, it's no coincidence that I became a licensed skydiver. You know? Tell us about um, that. High risk, great speed, thrill, challenge. Well, yeah, but it's more about the dopamine, right? When you save your own life and you land and you're very happy, you're, you're, you're chock full of dopamine. I'll bring my laptop to the drop zone and I'll, I'll do a jump and I'll sit down in a corner right after it's over. I'll throw my gear in the corner. I'll sit down and I'll, I'll write 10,000 words. Wow. You know, it's, again, it's understanding how your brain works and understanding how it works differently from other people and not caring that, that the things you do to make your brain function might be looked at as strange. You know, a great example is uh, United Airlines, um, I think runs about 10% of their fleet on biofuels. And um, when they first th started thinking about doing that, everyone said, oh, that's crazy, you'll never do it, you can't make any money. Well, they figured a way to make money at it and do it well. And they didn't care what other people thought or other airlines thought or whatever, they just did their thing. And now it's working with them very, very well. You know, so that's sort of what I, uh, what I learned. You know, I'm gonna do what works for me, whether it's skydiving or exercising or triathlon or mountain climbing or sitting in a forest, whatever it is, I'm gonna do what works for me because it works for me and, and I don't really care what other people think. If it 
if these other people don't don't help me pay my mortgage, what's, what, why should I care? So you you actually say this. Um, this is your quote. Uh, uh, you are actually much more free when you are neurodiverse. And so I think you're talking about that neuro, recognizing your neurodiversity. So in, in your day, can you walk us through how does your day look like and how have you shaped it? So that, uh, which kind of ties in with this, your mega success. And to me, your mega success is really because you have successfully harnessed your ADHD uh, and that has transposed itself in the productivity that you're able to accomplish. So what are, what are you doing in your day um, that we can learn from? I have four sort of life rules um, that I put in place. And I find that when those life rules work, I have a good day. When they don't work, I have a bad day. Um, I have to get up early and exercise. Sometimes in order to do that and exercise before my daughter wakes up, sometimes I have to get up as early as 3 a.m. But it's worth it because I'm a better person when I exercise, I have a better day, everything just works. Um, and you do that in your New York apartment and with kettlebells, I heard. <laughs> kettlebells, my New York apartment, and I occasionally get outside sometimes and um, I'm able to do it, uh, you know, on the days that I have my daughter, I'm able to go outside and, and, and ride or, or run, <coughs> excuse me, as well. Um, so that's mandatory. Uh, getting enough sleep is mandatory. I try for eight hours a night. Love sometimes that. I make it, sometimes I don't. Um, what else? Uh, try to eat healthy foods. You know, you'll find that um, if you eat like crap, you tend to feel like crap. Mm -hmm. So I try to avoid, you know, uh, processed foods, things like that. I don't, I don't always succeed. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I will eat pizza till I die. But, you know, <laughs> I try to do other things. And then um, I minimize choice as much as possible. Uh, I love that. I have, you know, I have a um, closet that has two sides to it and they're labeled. One says uh, office slash travel and it's t-shirt and jeans. The other side says uh, speaking slash TV and it's button down shirt, jacket and jeans. That's it. Right. I, uh, all my suits, my, my sweater vests, things like that. Those, those sit in my daughter's closet because if I had to wake up every day and look at something, well, oh, what should I wear? I wonder, uh, oh, I remember that vest. Oh, Laura gave me that vest. I wonder how she's doing. I should look her up. <laughs> Three hours later, I'm naked and living on Facebook. I haven't left the house. So um, it's just, it's better. And when you do those things, life gets easier. I think that's remarkable. And, and I think to me, what's so interesting, it's so applicable to everybody's life if they want to improve their productivity. Just because you don't have ADHD or distractibility and kind of scattered, uh, intense desire to pursue many goals doesn't mean uh, you will be productive. So that's really, really assuring to me. And, uh, you know, uh, the other thing that as I have been uh, thinking about you and your work, uh, why do you think it's so hard for people to understand ADHD? And why are people with ADHD not received well or don't get uh, the support or tolerance they deserve? Uh, they are high energy, but it can be intimidating or overwhelming. They crack jokes all the time and it can be fun and funny, but eh, leaves a little sour taste sometimes. So there's that, that tricky balance. And I feel like particularly the adult clients that I've worked with, I often tell them kind of, you know, uh, bring your, your partners, your listening partners along so that they know this is what you do and if they can nudge you. Uh, but but average person may not know that. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, a lot of people don't understand um, why I do the things I do. They think I'm crazy for getting up as early as I do. Um, but it works for me. And again, it doesn't. So many great ideas that have that could have easily changed the world never made it because people didn't pursue them because they were afraid what other people would think if they failed. I just stopped caring. Once you stop caring what other people think, you really are free. You know, people do things differently. It's just, it's just life. It's, it's what we do. And your way might be totally different than mine, but 
it's okay. If neither of us are hurting each other or hurting anyone else doing it the way we do it, who cares? Let us do it. So, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, it's a, a very simple view and a very basic view. Um, but it's the same view on, on that I have like on things like racism and things like that. It's like that guy over there having brown skin or being gay or whatever <laughs> doesn't affect my life. So why am I going to waste time hating on someone for absolutely no reason that affects me? You know, I don't care who that man marries. If he marries a girl, great. If he marries a guy, great. It doesn't affect my life. And I think more people need to think about that. You know, uh, there's this whole trend of the, you know, the Karens of the world, as it were. And, and if you look at these women, all these women that are caught on video being Karens, they're complaining about something that really doesn't have any bearing on them. And it's sort of the same way I look at it with my ADHD. I, I heard a great quote once, life is too short to care about what people in a free app that lives on my phone, that lives in my pocket, think about me. <laughs> great. And so, Look, I'm not perfect, but I try to get a little better, a little bit better every day, and um, I'm having fun. That's, That's all that matters, great. I think. So, talk to us a little bit about how does in ADHD show up in intimacy or intimate relationships, whether that's with your lover, your partner, your you know married spouse, or your children. <laughs> Do you see that interfering and? Do you have some thoughts about how to conquer that? I wrote a piece about this actually. Um, it's difficult sometimes. Uh, it's difficult to date someone with ADHD. It's difficult to, to love someone with ADHD because several things. You know, number one, they think a lot faster than you do. So, you know, if I have a fight with you, in my mind, we've already dated, gone out, gotten into a fight, broken up, moved on with our lives. Like in my head, that's happened in like 15 seconds. Um, it takes a lot of time to slow down and realize that, you know, perfect example. I'll have a great day in the, I'll have a great day where I'll, have a, I'll get a win or something like that. And, and I'll go to call um, my girlfriend and I'll be like, hey, I just did this thing. And she's not there. Right. And so I'll call her on her cell phone and she's not there. And, you know, I'll think, obviously she doesn't care about me and she doesn't care. That I just got this major win. God, I can't believe I'm so stupid for dating someone so terrible, you know, and, and, and I'll write her an email. I'm breaking up with you. This is terrible. You don't care. About me. And then three minutes later, three minutes later, I'll get a, I'll get a, a call from her. Hey honey, I was just an impromptu meeting with my boss. How's everything going? What's up? You know, but in my mind, we're already divorced, right? So it's like, it's funny when you think about it like that, but it's kind of random. You know, that's, that's, we don't, when you're ADHD, your brain moves a lot faster. And if you're not aware of that and you're not working on it and you're not constantly working on it, it can get difficult. Um, the thing about ADHD is that I can absolutely positively 100% intend to do something. And I just forget to do it. On the flip side, if you're dating me, you're going to wind up with flowers on some random Tuesday and the card's going to say, because it's Tuesday. Great spontaneity. That's great spontaneity. But you might tell me something 400 times that I need to do and I'm going to forget, even though I 100% absolutely intended to do it, you know, it's, it's difficult. It, it's never easy. I, I really like the way you broke it down for us because I think um, I have worked with many, many clients whose marriages have broken up because of that. I'll, I'll give you one example. When my client uh, came in uh, who had a daughter and she was going to turn one. And wife gave him one job. And she said, your job is to just create a montage of photographs and videos that we have <laughs> over the one year. That's it. 
nothing else. I'll manage the party, I'll manage the guest list, I'll manage yep. everything, even like, and it was a weekend, a week before. And so he hadn't forgotten that the party was next week. So he had not even started yep. the process of gathering the pictures. And then he start, asked his wife, where are the pictures? And she was so blown away because she said, she's turning one, like this child was not in our life before. Yep. You so had you so much time to do this, right. One. And he comes back after one week after the girl, uh, baby, baby's birthday. And she, he says to me, my wife, the party was great, but my wife wants a divorce. And he was so taken up aback by her response because he said, but I'm such a good person. And I said, well, the, the birthday was a combination of many, many things that have happened over the whole period of time you've been together. So sometimes I feel that, that missing of the forest uh, uh, and just paying attention to the trees can really be a costly affair in the intimate relationship. It's true. It's not easy. You know, it, it, it is a situation that is hard to, um, hard for someone without ADHD to understand because in their mind, it's A to B to C. Find the pictures, build the montage, submit it. In our head, it's, okay, we got to do this thing. Here we go. We're going to look at those pictures. Oh, I went... Interesting. I wonder if there's a way to make that picture sharper. Let me go into Photoshop. Let's learn how to use Photoshop. Okay, I've learned how to use Photoshop. Interesting. I can make I can make all these pictures sharp. I'm going to start making pictures when I was eight years old sharp. It's just a process, <laughs> and, and it's, it's it's not easy. I know, and and it's so insidious. It's so hidden. It's so pervasive, constantly happening, but it's completely uh, not available for an average observer to know. No, they don't get it. And it's, so, it's you know, they, they either think you're incredibly strange or just incredibly annoying. And so you got to start doing these things. You got to find someone who understands you and understands that the things you're doing that are different, you know, are actually to prevent these sort of things from happening. That's the best solution. Yes. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Peter, here's my struggle with my clients. Okay. Whether they're in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, married, about to get divorced, they are fundamentally resistant. And I'm talking about those who are resist, resisting this. There's some concept of sense of autonomy they want to exercise where they feel it has to be my idea, but then they don't arrive to this conclusion until they have bounced around a little bit, failed a little bit. But then that can be extremely costly and psychologically uh, off-putting or uh, you know, can create a great uh, disadvantage. So how do you think uh, people in my position who are helpers and, and counselors and, and great mentors kind of get the buy-in that they want the change, but they feel it has to be my way, but they can't figure out the my way yet. Good question. I mean, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's a tough position to be in. I know that for me, um, I know that I've failed a lot and I'm happy I have because failing has helped me, you know, failing is, is one of those great things that allows me to succeed. I learn from it. Um, there are people who, you know, won't necessarily be happy until they've failed and, and they have to prove that they can do it. So, you know, I think that people who have to deal with clients like that have to understand that they're, they can suggest everything. It's the whole concept of leading a horse to water type thing, right? Yes. You can suggest as much as you want. At some point, you know, it's like, it's like, um, I've always known that if I want to get faster, I have to do weightlifting as well as my bike riding and my cardio. Um, I've always known that it's basic science, right? I'm not stupid, but it's also um, not something I love to do. So until I learned that, until I tried doing it and forced myself to do it and saw the gains that I made in my next race, then I realized, holy crap, this is huge. And so nothing will change until someone decides they're ready to change. So when you decide you're ready to change, you know, somehow the, the, the therapist has to know that, know when that moment is, and then they swoop in. Beautiful. You're, you're right. And, and I think what's so interesting, I love in your work, uh, and I quote you all the time, and, and at, send my clients your um, uh, podcast way 
is you have managed to discover the power of body brain relationship. You bring your ADHD back into your body. You, you have focused on training this body, getting control over your body because a lot of people, particularly the smart, really kick ass smart ADHD folks that I work with, they're so cerebral that they don't do the hard work with, with, that requires cooperation from their body. So if you're feeling lazy, it's the body that can get you going. One so of the things I learned about that. I, I heard a great quote from a, um, a football coach once. He said, um, something like there's no right moment that the body wants to exercise. Exercise has to start in the brain. It has to be the brain saying to the body, it's time to go to work. And you can't just say, okay, I'm going to go work out now and assume that your body wants to do it. You know, you, you, it's painful to lift weights. It hurts. It really is. Why would you want to, why would you want to voluntarily do something that hurts you? Because you know, the results are going to be worth it, but your body doesn't know that your body's like, shit, this hurts. I don't want to do this. So you do it once and then your body says, I'm not doing it again. And then when you get up to go to the gym again, your body says, I don't want to do this. You don't understand. And it's at that point that it becomes a mental game that your brain has to go in and say, okay, I know you don't want to do this, but it's for your own good. Shut up. Do it. Um, what's, what's the quote? Um, a quote from Homer Simpson. He's talking to his brain. He's, he has to take a test or something. And he says, okay, brain, I don't like you and you don't like me. Let's just get this done and I can go back to killing you with alcohol. You know, it, it's, it's very true. You know, you got to sort of accept the fact that it's going to happen. I'm going to get through it. Here's how we're going to do it. And then we'll go back to normal. But you have to do it. I love that. So now let's talk about your entrepreneurship. Um, not only you, you're very bright, full of ideas. Uh, you certainly have a very unique and creative ways of problem solving, which is where you are able to channel that energy and creativity. Tell us. How do you define entrepreneurship and how did you like how did you come into your your first idea which is the the hair uh, am i saying that correctly the the help a reporter out the hero.com help a reporter out yeah so again it you know help a reporter started because i wasn't smart enough to think that it would fail you know it, <laughs> I came up with an idea like, oh, let's see what happens. And I launched it. Most people do research. They do case studies. No, nah, like, fuck it. Let's just see what happens, right? Um, but I love that because it wound up selling for several million dollars. I love um, it. You know, it's the kind of thing that, that, that I had this idea. I'm like, let's see what happens if I do this. But tell, uh, go back a little bit. How did you even come up with that idea? It's so So wonderful. when you're ADHD, you talk to everyone, right? If you're on a plane next to me, unless you fake your own death, I'm going to know everything about you by the time we land. <laughs> I'm, I'm naturally curious. People that ADHD are naturally curious. And so, so to sit there and say, okay, I wonder what happens if. Every great idea in the world started with, I wonder what happens if. Um, and so I just had this huge Rolodex. And reporters who I knew from working as a PR guy and all that, would call me. Peter, I'm working on a story, who do you know? I go, call this guy, call that guy. And over time, it took too much out of my day and I'm like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. I wonder if other people would wanna help these reporters, not just me. And so I launched a Facebook group. At that time, there was a 1500 person limit in the group. We hit that in like, three weeks. Oh my goodness. I'm like, I wonder if I can move this over to the web. Well, I don't know how to code, but I know a kid who for a hundred bucks and like a case of beer will probably do it for me. I called him from the lounge at LAX, told him what I wanted to do, got on a plane, connected in Houston, called him again. He had two questions for me, answered those, landed back at Newark from Houston, had a website done. And from that launched the company and from there it, it, it blew up. And so it's one of those things where 
it's one of those things where there was a bigger player in the space already, but I had an idea about how to do it better. And one of the great things about ADHD is that while you might get hung up on stupid shit, like there could be 5,000 reviews in my book that are all positive and one negative, And I'll look at the negative and be like, Oh my God, this is horrible. You know, that's the only one I see. Right. But on the flip side, there's also, you tend to not let the small stuff or the big stuff sweat you either. Yeah. I'm going to start this. If it fails, I'll do something else. You know, my attention span is short. If it fails, I forget about it, but I want to do something else. Well, it succeeded yeah. and it succeeded to be on my wildest dreams. So I got very lucky in that regard. But you know, at the end of the day, it just comes down to doing, doing things that you enjoy. And, you know, there's that stupid book, uh, Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow. It sounds cheesy, but it kind of works. I, and, and I think you also are pointing out something very, very uh, true is, is if you're in the space where your true passion shows up, then your motivation doesn't need any motivation. <laughs> you don't need any external push. It's totally Not true. At all. My perfect day is a day where I go to sleep and I don't know whether or not I was at work or having fun. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. That's the best time of day. That's how I'm feeling right now being with you, Peter. Well, I'm flattered. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> love, love talking with you. So tell me a little bit about um, working with folks who have ADHD. So, uh, you know, if not careful, the impulsivity and the need to be quick, um, um, witty and funny can come across as rudeness or insensitivity and that can ru ruin relationship. But now that you sit on the other side and if you are dealing with folks with ADHD, how are you finding interacting with them? If they work for you or is there for your partners? One of the keys is that you have to understand that faster brains doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's like you. They could have a faster brain and manifest it in different ways. So one of the things that I've learned is that it's very important to sort of understand the way people think and let them think the way they think. You can work with them and help them improve things, but you can't judge them because they think differently than you do. You know, ADHD is a weird, a weird gift in the respect that it doesn't it doesn't allow for sort of one way of thinking. Mm. There are multiple ways. And so I find that some of the best things I could do are let people be people, let them think the way they want, let them do whatever, you know, and offer ideas and suggestions that have helped me. But if they choose to implement them differently or whatever, that's fine. Let people be people. So you're very accommodating and very generous with the stylistic approach to things. Yes. The only thing I'm not generous about is time. If you, That's if I give you yeah. my time or offer my time, you know, I don't care if you're ADHD or, or, or any sort of neurodiversity, it doesn't take that much to be on time. <laughs> and that sort of key, right? Cause my, my thing is if you're not on time, it's going to screw up. I'm not going to allow your, inability to be on time to screw up my day, right? If you can't be on time, that doesn't mean that my schedule should then be screwed up. So if you show up 15 minutes late and we only have a 20 minute meeting, well, guess what? You only have five minutes with me, sorry. Because I'm not gonna throw off the rest of my day because you couldn't get your ass out of bed. So true. So let's talk about now parenting. You're a single dad. And you have a seven-year-old? I do. Oh, wow. So wh what are the gifts of um, being a parent, which I'm sure it's a rhetorical question, but uh, what are the challenges that may be become a special challenges now that you're on the other side of parenting a child? And, and does she struggle with ADHD or is that your worry? Or tell us. It's not that. a worry per se. I mean, I see, I definitely see signs of it in her. Um, I think that she's a, 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 a wonderful kid. I really enjoy um, being a dad. It's, it's funny, this whole COVID situation has given me this chance to be um, home with her all the time. You know, I used to be on the road a lot. And um, it's, it's tough sometimes. You know, it's not easy. Sometimes it's... Um, what parts are uh, tough? Well, you know, when I tell her not to do something and, and five minutes later she's doing it anyway, Right, I, I know that it's not, I'm not sitting there thinking, okay, you, you don't, it's, it's this concept of why aren't you listening, but, but it's rather like, cause you're seven. I, 
you have to, you can't look at a seven year old the same way you look at a 45 year old, right? And so you sort of have to understand that they're gonna be different and that's fine. Life goes on. But you know, on the flip side, I've, I've had to learn how to be more aware um, and, 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 and slow down and chill a bit and you know, enjoy uh, the time with her you know, I mean, her school, her schooling, the, the, this, this whole COVID situation has been brutal, right? You know, every single one of her teachers has lied to me. Uh, she is not a pleasure to have in class. And, um, you know, it, it's difficult. And so, you know, I'm trying to do the best that I can. And, but at the end of the day, I'm very fortunate that I have the opportunity to work from home and, and work the way I want to work. And so we, we, it's a lot of fun. We're having a really good relationship and I really enjoy it. It's just, like I said, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And... Um, but then again, most worthwhile things are not right. Yeah. I found very few worthwhile things that are, or very few things that are worth doing, um, that are not hard to do. Mm -hmm. And the thrill is, is, is in doing them in getting them done. So, you know, in this ADHD business, we never talk about your own experience with emotional regulation, uh, you know, shortness of temper or quickness to, frustration, uh, lack of uh, concern for other people's condition. Uh, how, uh, how do you think uh, there's a little bit of a less empathy with people with ADHD if they're not careful? And you talk a lot about slowing down and that slowing down can really be hard if you're really irritated uh, you know, or um, just upset. Do you notice that or is that your experience? Yeah, you have to be aware of that, definitely, no doubt. You have to... Um... You know, one of the things about ADHD is that if we're having an argument, I need to know that you hear me. I need to know that you listen to what I'm saying. I need to know that you're hearing me. And when, um, if I feel like you're not, and I feel like I didn't get my point across, I can't move on to the next topic. And so I'm probably going to wind up raising my voice because I need you to hear me. You know, even if you disagree with what I'm saying, just, just tell me that you've heard me. And that'll go a long way. On the flip side, I've had to work on, again, not raising my voice and staying calm and staying focused and on topic and on point. And um, hearing the other person too. Yeah, I'm a terrible arguer. Hearing... And I've worked, been working on that for years to try to improve that. No <laughs> question about it. Who is not actually? <laughs> yeah. We are so busy making a point that we hardly have time to listen to other person's point. <laughs> yeah, debate never would have been my favorite subject in school. <laughs> so now tell me this idea of social media and you're the guru of social media or navigating or solving problems. I am so struggling with, uh, you know, all the research, uh, uh, researcher Jean Twenge, for example, who has talked about this incredible wave of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, uh, and criminal behaviors in children because of when the cell phones became handheld tool available to every child in 2011. And I'm just curious, you as a father probably are going to have to deal with this. Your daughter wanting social media accounts. I'm already dealing with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So tell um, me, what are your thoughts about here you are consulting and getting people to think about things about sticky ways of getting people's attention and then ADHD people struggling to unglue their attention from those things that sparkle. So the key is you have to set rules. You own your cell phone. Your cell phone does not own you. Darling, it's so easy to say. How do you do it? Tell people. So my phone, when I go to sleep, my phone is off. Not silent, off. I love that. Because an iPhone takes approximately 45 seconds to a minute to boot up. If I wake up at two in the morning to go to the bathroom and I come back, if my phone is on, even if it's silent, I'm going to look at it. But I'm not going to stay up 45 extra seconds to wait for it to boot up before I look at it. I'm gonna go right back to sleep. Love that. So the key is setting these rules, right? Right now during our talk, my computer has been on do not disturb mode. Me too. So nothing has come through. I haven't seen any pop-ups. I rarely have pop-ups because pop-ups, I don't use Slack. Slack is, 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 is oh. gonna be responsible for the downfall of society. Every time we get a notification, it takes 24 minutes for someone with ADHD to get back into their deep work. So oh, if you get two notifications an hour, you've just ruined your day. 
So again, it's about having those rules and putting them into place. Um, my daughter, like she has her own iPad, but she knows that if she wants to play a game, once she has to ask me first. The only thing she doesn't have to ask me about are um, her educational games. Of course, she rarely plays them. You know, so <laughs> it, it's it's about setting limits and setting these rules so that you are you are again, so you own the communications device. It doesn't own you. Well, what I'm hearing you say also is you kind of have discovered the value of your time and you are unwilling to be victim of these things that interrupt your own flow. 100%. That's incredible insight. You know what I mean? I had a, uh, someone in my life who I'm still very good friends with. She used to see that I worked out super early. She's like, my God, I can't believe you worked out so early. It's amazing. How do you get up so early? I wish I could do that. I'm like, I see that you're on Facebook at one in the morning liking a photo of a car owned by a kid you went to grade school with if you went to bed early, you could do this too. You know, it comes down to the fact that we have a certain number of hours in the day and we have to decide what our priorities are for those things. And if this person likes being on Facebook at one in the morning, like, then that's fine but every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So it's going to come at the expense of something else. You have to decide where the priority is. End of story. Well, you, you are so incredibly on target and your clarity is extremely inspiring. Thank you, Peter, for being here with us on this full prefrontal podcast. Uh, you, I, I really find having, you know, done this work for 20 years, working with people who are struggling and are not able to discover this for themselves. You are such a ray of hope and, and a sunshine and gives me incredible confidence that they too can discover this uh, truth about themselves. So thank you for doing the work that you do. And thank you for everyone who joined us today. Please keep spreading the word if you like the podcast that you're listening to and know that executive functions matter and knowing how to manage your focus, attention, time, prioritizing your life by paying attention to your relationship is the meaning of life. So please stay well, be safe, and have fun. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.